Welcome to the Explore Words Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, Gary Young reflects on witnessing some of modern history's biggest moments, including joining revelers during Obama's victory and entering New Orleans days after Hurricane Katrina, to interviewing Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Maya Angelou and Stormzy. Recorded live at the 2023 Bradford Literature Festival, this episode explores race, racism and black life through the lens of one of the country's leading political voices. Thank you. Uh... Thank you all for being here, and, uh, and thank you for uh, uh, putting up with uh, uh, the, the lovely weather that is now becoming, I think, more emblematic of the UK than, uh, than it certainly was when I lived here uh, uh, many, many years ago. I don't, think, uh, I don't think we ever had two days like this in a row, uh, and now, now we have entire months of it. Uh, this, is, this is, on a personal level, a real privilege uh, to, uh, to be in conversation uh, with uh, as you might imagine, in America, journalism is, uh, is a mixed bag these days. And to find someone who has uh, not only the courage, but the integrity uh, and the accessible voice of, uh, of, of my, uh, my guest here uh, is, is rare and, uh, and, a, and a real uh, treat to be involved. Uh, and that, of course, is Gary Young. Uh, I, of course, as many of you, probably uh, encountered uh, Gary's work uh, through The Guardian. And uh, I was, of course, very fortunate to uh, discover him uh, as the internet opened up and uh, we were able to access The Guardian in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the United States. And I remember that when I would come to the UK and land at Heathrow, one of the first things I would do is, is get a copy of The Guardian. I, uh, first of all, I like to actually read a, a newspaper and then make sure that it was a, uh, an issue that, that Gary was in. Uh, well, here we have a collection of uh, articles uh, that Gary has uh, compiled called Dispatches from the Diaspora. Uh, I'm sure that some of you will probably already be familiar with uh, the articles, uh, as am I, having read them in real time uh, and uh, remembering the context uh, in which these are articles emerged. Uh, but together they weave uh, a fascinating story. So, first of all, welcome, Gary Young. Thank you. My first question, Gary, is uh, I, I'm intrigued by the title, uh, Dispatches from, from the Diaspora. Uh, what, in your estimation, is the diaspora? Well, this, refer, this particular diaspora, just, there are many, this diaspora is kind of the sub-Saharan black diaspora, the, the, um, uh, which as a child of Caribbean immigrants in particular, you already have a very diasporic sensibility. You know, I have family like most people from the Caribbean. I have family in Florida, Toronto. Um, weirdly, my family never made it to New York. They ended up in Texas, which was a mistake. Um, uh, uh, the Caribbean, London, and then elsewhere. And there is an understanding that people move. Where is so-and-so now? Oh, they've gone to, you know, such and such a place. Um, so I think I was raised with a diasporic sensibility, those kind of flimsy airmail letters coming in and so on. The blue aerogram? Yes, yeah. exactly. And, uh, and being sent. But then... Added to that in the book, there is also, of course, um, the African diaspora, so um, uh, South Africa uh, in Zimbab and Zimbabwe uh, primarily, which it wasn't a huge leap of imagination when I was growing up to identify with, right? So I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement. My first picket was of the South African embassy. So, um, so that... To me, it's the black diaspora, it's also my diaspora, if you like. And the challenge was which bits of the diaspora kind of to leave out. So I did quite a lot of work in Haiti, that's not in there. I did some work in Sierra Leone, that kind of didn't make it. 
So it is a lot of the more obvious places. South Africa, Zimbabwe, Britain, America. Um, uh, there's one set in Europe and uh, a couple in the Caribbean. So I noticed that your book is, uh, is divided into sections mm -hmm. when it comes to these articles. And uh, the, the headings of these uh, sections are, are songs. M mostly. Mostly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you've got Change is Going to Come, Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. uh, Things Fall Apart, Ways of Seeing, uh, Express Yourself. The Madonna one? No, that's uh, Charles... I can't remember his name, but I remember the song. Yeah, I think I actually might, might have it here. I think it's Charles Wright. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Things Fall Apart by the Roots, mm -hmm. right? And also uh, uh, Chinua Biche's uh, yeah. uh, book title, and then uh, Me, Myself, I, Beyonce? Um, Joe Norma Traden. Oh, okay, very good, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, are, are, let me go ahead and ask first, um, any Queen Bee fans here? Because <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I need to get out alive. <laughs> and and my, my, my views on Beyonce have, have uh, elicited uh, uh, issues, particularly among my students. But, but I, uh, as, as, a, as a music fan, I, I really uh, appreciated that. Uh, as a Detroiter, uh, Madonna uh, being from Detroit, that's why I reflexively was obliged to ask if it was Express Yourself Madonna. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but the very first uh, uh, story that you, that you provide in uh, Change is Gonna Come is in fact when you went to Soweto to mm. cover the 1994 uh, elections that brought Nelson Mandela mm. into, uh, into power. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's the article that gets me my job. <clears throat> um, I'm sent, The Guardian is looking for somebody. It starts with a classic liberal dilemma, actually, which is The Guardian is sufficiently attuned to understand that there are, there are articles that white journalists can't do in apartheid South Africa, in the run-up to the biggest story that that country had had in quite some time. But they are not sufficiently attuned to actually have hired black journalists that they want to send them. <laughs> So, and they don't know what they don't know. So they want, it's a speculative um, runaround. And it's telling that no other British newspaper had even figured this out. So the entire British press corps was white, with the exception of me. And the Guardian looked around for somebody young, black, and cheap. And I was the youngest, blackest, cheapest thing that they had. <laughs> So I was 24 when I was sent out there. I had my 25th birthday there. And my job was to kind of um, to stay in the township, which I would have wanted to do anyway, um, and to follow Mandela around. Uh, and I, I lucked out. And my luck was I couldn't drive. It doesn't sound very lucky, but South Africa is a place where you really need to drive to get about, and I couldn't. So I would have to kind of organize lifts. People would take you there, then someone else would take you back. At one, one rally I went to, someone took me there, then somebody else took me half the way back. They said, um, somebody else is coming to this gas station, they'll pick you up. And it was a film crew who were working with Mandela's bodyguards. And I traveled with the bodyguards. And they amu I amused them. I made it my business to amuse them. And we had, I'd been involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I had studied in the Soviet Union because my degree was in French and Russian. I didn't look like I was going to do anything stupid or run off and say, ooh, the bodyguard swore or, you know, do some sort of stupid story. Well, this is because you were young, black and cheap. Yes, right. exactly. Okay. So they just let me kind of drive around with them. So they would kind of come and pick me up and I would um, roll around with these bodyguards. So I ended up embedded in the biggest story in the world at the time, like just sort of stumbling into it. You imagine sort of stumbling into Obama's entourage in 2008. That was me. Um, I was 25. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And, um, and it was this... It wasn't a very difficult thing to write about, is the truth of it, that you would go to these 
stadia in the middle, you know, apartheid would create these townships in the middle of nowhere, sometimes no electricity, just nothing. So it would be in the middle of nowhere and you'd, you'd wait real hot and then you'd see way off in the distance because there's nothing between you and it, the cavalcade coming, kicking up dust and then everyone would start going now. A lot of them hadn't seen him apart from on a poster, didn't have a television and had been in jail for so long. And the dust is getting bigger and the cavalcade's getting closer and they sing as old ladies with no teeth and children with no shoes and they're singing and they're dancing and they're waving their placards and, you know, you think that you only have to, I only have to see this once in my life and I can die happy. But I saw it like, you know, five or six times. And, um, and then at a certain point Mandela would get, the cavalcade would stop and then Mandela would get out of the car and get onto a white truck. And then he would come into the stadium kind of waving his fist like that. And it was, um, it was an amazing thing to witness. And that's what a lot of the pieces in the book are me bearing witness to things, just being there in that moment. And this was one of them. But this is your maiden assignment. Yeah. I mean, this isn't covering, uh, for example, uh, you know, the opening up of a new Pret a Manger in Bradford, which yeah. is coming to here, by the way. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, this is this is the assignment. Yeah. How did you process that? I, I mean, obviously, it it, uh, it it was well received. Moving past the emotion of being there, what was it like after that? I mean, did did you feel like how can I top this? No, no, I thought, shit, I got away with it. You know, <laughs> I thought kind of, um, you know, um, that could have gone horribly wrong. I really, I remember describing, uh, applying for a fellowship in America, actually, and describing my career up until that day as being one in which I kept being told to sink or swim. And I did manage to get to the other side, but I took in a lot of water. You know, and so this was, I had a pretty clear idea that I was out of my depth, but I didn't know what the depth was. I didn't know how out of my depth. So then all you could do was roll with it and roll with what you saw and kind of, and trust that that was going to be good enough and sort of watch what other people did and sometimes do the opposite and sometimes do that. Um, and um, so there's, a, there's a, a, a little, a couple of lines that people really remarked on the at the time, and since the book has come out, um, people, because that's the one piece in there that you can't find on the internet, and um, people have remarked, like, you were 25, and you said Nelson Mandela was a bit of a boring speaker. Like, wh what did you think you were doing? You know, and you know, I have to, two answers to that. Well, three really. First is I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> the second was I just thought my job was to write what I see, and and that is connected to my third point, which was the guy's been in jail for twenty-seven years. He's come out, led a movement, almost certainly into power. He's trying to keep a multi-ethnic coalition together and stop the country dissolving into civil war. He doesn't have to be a good speaker. He's done enough. And so I, him not being a good speaker didn't interrupt my understanding of him, which was this thing, I think, and Obama had it too, of kind of wanting those black people who arise in those moments not to be people, but to be super people. So let's take it to Obama, 2008. Mm. The election happens November, and you were in Chicago covering it. Mm. Um, we talked briefly earlier, my sister, who's 11 years younger than I, went to Grant Park, which was where Obama came and spoke that night, and she said that she's never experienced anything like that. She said, 
uh, strangers were coming up to her, African-American women, and just giving her a hug, mm. and tears were flowing elsewhere. Uh, you weren't at Grant Park, but you mm. were uh, at really an epicenter of uh, especially uh, black life in Chicago. Mm. Yeah, so my MO by that stage, and they were talking <clears throat> I'm 50 years and about 50, 50 years older and about 30 pounds heavier by that stage. And my MO was you don't want to be where everybody else is. Like, what can you add? <clears throat> so if it was just, Chicago, if I was just a Chicago citizen, I'd want to be in Grand Park, where everybody else was. But as a journalist, I'm thinking, well, the whole world's media is there. What do I add to that? Um, and there is a kind of, well, so I decided to go to the south side of Chicago, which is where the African Americans live. And um, uh, there, is a, there, is, there is a pub called the President's Lounge, a bar. And, you know, like all the bars in the south, they were having an election night. I went the night before, found a guy, went to vote with him that morning, and then went to the bar that night and watched it with people there. And it was, it was wild. And it was a bit different, I think, to Grand Park because it was an exclusively African-American place. The only white person in the room was the Guardian videographer. And I said to him, if Obama loses, you're on your own. You really <laughs> <have that." laughs> I don't know you. Um, uh, because you saw the scale, in a way, fall from their eyes a little bit. You saw them, you know, the, I remember the woman sitting next to me, I remember, you know, because they would, the, there would be a kind of rotating, they would rotate the states going, these are the votes from Indiana, or these are the votes from Kentucky. Indiana was never votes Democrat. You know, and the first votes came in and they were really kind of, um, you know, pro-Republican. She was going, racist-ass Indiana. You know, bunch of racists, <laughs> like, screw them. And then by the end of the night, Indiana was too close to call. Right. And you could see her thinking, damn, like, what the hell happened in Indiana? And it was them, their sense of maybe, because that election, even though he was leading in the polls, Nobody knew that they could trust the polls. There's a thing called the Bradley effect, or the, um, oh, there's a guy in Virginia that's named after as well, which um, is that when it comes to polls and black candidates, that white people might lie because they kind of think they should vote for the black guy, and they know that's the answer that they should give, but they kind of, when they get into the polling booth, they can't bring themselves to do it. So there was that element that night that you didn't know until it had actually happened. Was there a fear factor, I mean, of thinking, we're so close and they just didn't want to set themselves up for a disappointment? Yeah, well, yeah, this was kind of eight years of Bush. And, you know, let's not forget the hanging chads of Florida. So the idea that kind of um, this could all go south, and, and bearing in mind that the primary concern about Obama's candidacy at the beginning was that he'd get assassinated. Which, if you think about what went down in the 60s, it's not crazy um, at all. So that was my mother-in-law, who's African-American. That was her concern. It was like, well, they'll kill him. If they think that he'll win, they'll kill him. So, um, so there was this kind of sense that, like, this country then is at least different to what we thought it was, even if they wouldn't call it, you know, any racist. But also what was interesting that night was the degree of delusion that there was even then. So another woman in the bar, when I think Ohio falls, when Ohio falls, it's always over. If it falls to a Democrat, that's it. Um, and she shouts, my man's in Afghanistan, he's coming home. And I'm thinking, no, he's not. That's the war that Obama has said he wants to continue. If he was in Iraq, he could say that. But that 
kind of was a little canary in the mind about how people want, they were so entranced by how he looked and how he was and how he was in so many ways the anti-Bush. Uh, he was eloquent rather than monosyllabic and um, uh, nuanced rather than brash and in a range of ways, you know, and you know, let's not forget how if you set him against Donald Trump, what you get, but that was, that was unimaginable at that stage. People thought Bush was the worst he could be. So, um, so people were kind of so entranced by the symbolic nature of his candidacy and the way in which he would leverage those symbols that they kind of weren't really listening to what he said quite often. And so they would set themselves up for disappointment. And of course, Obama kind of did play into that. I used to jokingly refer to him as the incognito because him being black was like his worst kept secret. You know, he, when he won in Iowa, which was the shock, and I was not the whitest state in the union, but it's up there. And he comes out and he said, they said this day would never come. Nobody thinks that he's talking about winning Iowa, right? But he doesn't need to say that I'm black and I won because everyone can see that. So then he can parlay that into something far more um, uh, opaque, obtuse almost. Um, and he kept doing that to the extent that when he takes the nomination, when he receives the nomination, accepts the nomination, I think it's called, at the Democratic Convention. So he's won already. He's won the Democratic nomination, he's not won the presidency. He quotes Martin Luther King, but he calls him the old preacher. He says, as the old preacher says, I'm thinking, dude, you can, you can name check Martin Luther King. I mean, people have settled on Martin Luther King as being okay. He's, um, not, he's not a Jeremiah Wright. He's not a Jeremiah Wright. He's not even close to Jeremiah Wright. And he's dead, so, you know, don't have to worry about that no more. And, uh, I mean, they've killed him already. So you can, you can, you can quote Martin Luther King. And, um, you know, white people quote Martin Luther King. I'm sure Bush quoted Martin Luther King. But Obama feels like he can't quote Martin Luther King. And so he calls him the old preacher. And so it's all like mental jiu-jitsu, signs and symbols, kind of, um, which, you know, was interesting to me. And, you know, one might argue that it worked. He won. And one might wonder, with a lot of that stuff, at what cost, right? That um, here's some things you can't say if you want to be the president of America. One of them, if you're black, is Martin Luther King. So this idea about illusions, uh, that you said that, I mean, here was a, a woman who thought, you know, her man's coming back from Afghanistan. There was on the left, it seems, uh, some level of thinking that Obama miraculously was going to end racism. Mm. Uh, I think some people on the right were worried he was going to end slavery. Uh, but uh, the, 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 where is Obama now, 15 years after that election, where is he seven years after his term of office? Where do you place him? Well, he's very lucky to have come in between one of the most stupid people ever to be president and one of the most repugnant people ever to become president. And so, you know, I mean, he looks like Einstein right now, right? He looks like a mixture of kind of Einstein, Boutros, Boutros, Gali, and FDR. He looks like... so. Um, I can't unthink that now, but thank you. <laughs> and um, the thing that I found interesting about him, and this recurs in 2020, is the degree to which when Black Lives Matter first kicks off, really kicks off, which is 2014 with the murder of um, um, Mike Brown in Ferguson uh, by the police, the protests take place almost without reference to Obama. So it's like a split screen. And on the one hand, you, on the one screen, you've got people demonstrating, uh, some of them rioting, 
some of them looting, but mostly demonstrating. And mothers crying and hashtags flying around. Uh, uh, and on the other screen, you have this guy calling for calm, who's the president, and they kind of, they are very separate. You know, that America managed to prove that it could elect a black man, but still can't prove that a black kid can walk down the street without getting murdered. And so I think he remains symbolic. He's the picture in the barbershop, the bodega, the diner. Um, for some people, it might be a wistful notion of what was. Um, although the truth is that black and white, the gap between black and white grew under Obama. Um, uh, but the truth is also that black people didn't feel that that was the most important thing about him and they didn't lay the blame on him. So he kind of, I think he stands somewhat abstracted as a, as a symbol. So if we go back to 2020 and um, the murder of George Floyd, you don't hear a lot from Obama and the degree to which one does hear a lot from him, it doesn't really cut through. Uh, people aren't looking to him for a lead, particularly. I mean, Michelle, Obama, uh, Michelle Obama's book sells real well, but that's not where people are looking for sort of an understanding of how to kind of deal with these moments, which is nothing but interesting, really. Well, I mean, here you have him as, of course, a former president, mm. and former presidents uh, oftentimes don't comment on uh, events, especially if it's seen as impugning uh, the incumbent uh, president at the time. This, by the way, has been a, uh, uh, a model shattered by, by Trump, uh, who comments on everything going back and forth. But the idea that, do you think that that uh, conceit shackled Obama in being able to comment as a private citizen, as a, as a, as a public figure, and more importantly, as a, as a, as a major black role model? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that kind of, um, because even when he was president, I don't feel that he was particularly relevant to those uprisings and outbursts. And um, I feel that Obama, I used to write, like, we don't have to give him the benefit of the doubt because he's the president and he has all the benefits he needs. He's the president, we have to hold him to critique. And I think that people, have been really reluctant to do that. So they will look at his presidency and they will blame the Republicans, who of course were awful. And they will say, I, I remember I, I taught, um, I was a visiting professor at Brooklyn College and I taught a course called Reporting Obama, which looked at how Obama was understood through the media. And there was, um, when he decided to escalate the war in Afghanistan, there was, um, I think front cover of Time on Newsweek said, Obama's war. And somebody brought it in and said, how would we understand this? And, you know, and I said, well, I think like, you know, two or three things. First of all, it's Obama's war as opposed to Bush's war. So Bush's war was Iraq. Obama's war, he was taking ownership of this war. Secondly, this is the war he supported. Thirdly, he is escalating this war. So that's, and I could hear somebody say, bullshit. <laughs> and I said, sorry? It was bullshit. And I said, yeah, no, I hear you. Like, that's, this is a place of learning. So do you want to expand on that just a little bit? And she said, you don't know what's in his heart. I said, if you, if, unless you're a cardiologist, you don't know what's in his heart either. <laughs> I can only talk about what he's doing. Uh, so if any of those things I said was wrong, or you think he's doing something else, I want to hear about it. You know, that would be a good conversation to have. 
But actually, I stopped teaching that class because the students who were overwhelmingly African-American or Caribbean-American didn't want to critique him. That wasn't, they didn't want to do that. And, uh, and I'm always mindful of that when people hear Republicans kind of giving Trump a pass. And I think, yeah, you know, I've seen that. I've seen that among liberals and progressives. You know, I don't like what he's doing with the drones, but maybe he knows something that we don't know. After all, he is the president. You know, it's like, well, you know, he's, he's killing a lot of people with those drones, so we know that. So people didn't, people didn't want to critique him, and that's partly because the Republicans were being so foul and so crazy that people felt that there wasn't the room to, but it's also because they didn't want to, like right from the get-go, they didn't want to. And if, if I may, by extension, because in a sense it relates to where we end up in Britain now, that when Obama stood, my son was born the weekend that he declared, and people would say, this would be great for your son, and I'd say, how? And they'd say, what do you mean, how? It's going to be a black president. Your son's black. It'd be great. And I'd say, not necessarily. So if it was Condoleezza Rice, she's black, would that be great for my son? No. Well, then why is this great for my son? You know, you know what I mean. And I'd say, no, I don't. Unless, if he's going to make it less likely that he can get shot, less likely that he can go to jail, more likely that he can graduate from college, more likely that he can get a decent job, that I want to hear. But there's a distinction between symbols and substance. Anyway, at that point, they switched off, and I was just like, Eeyore. Um, <laughs> but fast forward to Britain now, Rishi Sunak, Suella Breverman, Pretty Patel. If you were flabby in those conversations about Obama and what it meant to have a person of color in leadership, then you're stuck now. Because you can't just support diversity when diversity supports you. You have to kind of understand its meaning and its uses. And I don't think there's any brown or black skinned person or white person sitting on a plane heading to Rwanda thinking, well, at least the Asian woman did this. You know, that's, that's progress. And so we have to understand it does matter. The color of people in power does matter. But it counts. But sometimes it doesn't count for much. And we have to really kind of police those borders quite, quite carefully, because otherwise we end up with photo opportunities rather than equal opportunities. Well, I mean, a place like America, the, the notion of the symbolic, as you probably found when you were, when you were living there, everything has to be a first. Mm. And uh, of course, in the case of Clarence Thomas on the US Supreme Court, he wasn't the first. He was replacing uh, Thurgood Marshall. And I remember back in the 1990s, there was a, uh, uh, some show on, on uh, American TV, and, uh, and an adolescent, uh, uh, an African-American adolescent said, uh, I was looking for a role model, and said they gave me Clarence Thomas. Uh, the show was undoubtedly written by uh, people who were center-left or, or more, uh, but it served to be rather prescient, because Clarence Thomas has certainly uh, if nothing else, uh, come to embody uh, the, the American uh, political right. And you wrote in, uh, in one of your articles about uh, looking for Uncle Tom or searching mm. for Uncle Tom, a reference, of course, to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle, Tom, uh, Uncle Tom's cabin of the kind of uh, pliant, um, uh, dutiful, uh, and acceptable uh, black man uh, in that. Have we moved beyond that, that now, uh, as you said, uh, People aren't so concerned about Clarence Thomas being black, being transformational, uh, but issues of corruption uh, are there, and that's how he's viewed. He's not viewed as a corrupt, uh, allegedly corrupt uh, Supreme Court just a uh, black Supreme Court justice, but just an allegedly corrupt justice. Yeah, I think um, so. The the article that's in the book about in defense of Uncle Tom is actually, if you read the book, Uncle Tom is a very decent person, and it's also about how much I hate that term because it, it, it's used to give people a de-blacking, or a de, it, it's supposed to de-authenticate people. So lots of cultures have it, you know, anti-Zionist Jews might be called self-hating Jews. Irish people who are too into Britain 
called West Brit. Um, and in this case, um, a black people in church are called Uncle Tom's. And I think I mentioned Clarence Thomas is there. If he's right wing and disgusting, call him there. Don't say he's Uncle Tom like there's a way of being black and he is violating that way of being black. Now, to be honest, I think that people go, people go in and out of identities and people go in and out of being understood through their identities. So we take it away from race for one minute. Nadine Doris is, she decides to lead, she's not made a lord or a lady or a dame or whatever bollocks that was going to be. And um, she writes a piece for the Daily Mail saying um, how Rishi Sunak stopped a working class girl from Liverpool becoming a British lord. And it's like, oh, so you're into class now. That's interesting. You, you, you've got some class politics. I wonder where that came from. So you, you find people leveraging these things and also people... Because the thing about identities is that we all have them, but then they also exist in other people's eyes. So I, I may not feel particularly black, but I may look particularly, you know, I get blacker, the closer I get to Scandinavia, the blacker I get, right? Um, let's say. The, um, so, someone like Clarence Thomas, who has been in flight from racial identity, apart from when it served him, he called his grilling of a sexual harassment, a high-tech lynching. So it's like, okay, oh, so you're into civil rights now. That's interesting, right? So rest assured, if anything happened to Clarence Thomas around his corrupt behavior, he would evoke race and racism in a heartbeat. But for now, that's not understood to be the central dynamic. Now, my feeling is Clarence Thomas is always black every day. That may not be the most interesting thing about him, but it is a consistent thing about him. And therefore, we have to be very careful about how we talk about him because just because he's right-wing, it doesn't make him not black. So we have to be careful how we talk about him but like, if he's corrupt, we have to say he's corrupt. We just have to make sure that we say it in a way that doesn't open the door to like a lot of racist, uh, uh, you know, racial hatred. So um, uh, I find, by and large, the right wing to be far more consistent in their employment of identity politics than the left, actually. Uh, they're far more likely to talk about their kind of their whiteness or their religion or their national identity or when Trump comes out with a Bible that obviously he's never read <laughs> right, and a flag and stands in front of a church, that's identity politics. That's all it is. It's not like he's making an argument. Um, so, um, and, and he reaches his audience. Oh, I mean, they, it's a very they know exactly what he's saying. I mean, it couldn't be cruder. It's like he's mainlining, you know, he's, he's mainlining it. This government in Britain, even as they criticized the British football team, English football team, um, well, that was close, um, <laughs> even as they criticized the English football team for taking a knee saying it was gesture politics. It paid 163, they spent 163,000 pounds on flags, more than any year before. What's that if it's not gesture politics? It's not like we don't know where we live. It's not like we don't know what our flag looks like. So um, in all sorts of ways, the, the right, and it's, they're doing it right now, actually, in their attempt to distract people from the 
awful situation that we are in economically. They are talking about um, trans issues, which whatever you, whatever side of that you're on, the Tories are not our friends when it comes to issues of sexual orientation or gender. They're just not. Like, which doesn't mean one side or the other in that kind of what is passing for a debate there. Um, stop the boats. What does that even mean? You know, at a time when actually we have a labour shortage and people are running from wars that we started. Stop the boats. Like, if you could stop those boats, somehow people's mortgage payments would go down. So in a range of ways, this government leveraging identity as a, um, as a distraction. So when it comes to creating identity, especially in the area of cultural production, you've written about Bridgerton. Mm. Yes. I'm not going to leave you just at that. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and expand on, on what, what your, uh, your issues might be with that? Well... Because I have a feeling they're the same as my issues about Hamilton. Okay. But, yeah. Bridgerton... I haven't seen Queen Charlotte yet, and, you know, that's, that's on me. But, um, <laughs> you know, as a bonkathon around National Trust houses, it's great, you know, uh, period costume, you know, we all like a, um, oh, what was that kind of gorgeous dude? Um, can't remember his role. There's only one very, very gorgeous dude, the main man. Can anyone help me? I've, I've, I haven't seen the show. He's a duke. Go gorgeous Duke Bridgerton. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, so much eye candy. So that's great. But when it comes to like, my problem with Bridgerton if it was, first of all, if you're going to have if you're going to have something, and it was written after the first series, um, oh no, no, I'd seen the second series. I got, a, I got a advanced thing, but I was mostly irritated about the first series. Well, the second series backed it up really. Um, they had a choice of either having a multiracial cast and just pretending that race didn't exist, which they just couldn't quite bring themselves to do, or placing race somewhere in the middle of it. And instead, they kind of went halfway. And for most of the time, race had nothing to do with it. And then suddenly, it turned out Queen Charlotte was like, you know, Michelle Obama, and that th there were these kind of references to race that suggested that bad things had happened, and now they had been overcome. And that was kind of, first of all, I thought that was daft. But secondly, it was um, the difference between a multicolored cast and a multiracial cast. And I get exhausted with the use of color without race. So um, it was a multicolored cast, lots of people, with lots of, of lots of different hues, but none of those hues meant anything. Uh, un until they kind of inject this weird storyline into Well, it. that seems to be the same distinction uh, around the controversy about uh, the Little Mermaid, uh, a black mermaid, mm. that somehow the other, a, uh, a mythical creature, now is racialized and, and people are having a problem with that. Yeah, see, I didn't have a book because it's a mermaid. So mermaids, like, are already pretty strange. So <laughs> you could have a black one or a child, it don't matter because it's like, which mermaid will complain? Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's not, because it's not real. I, I didn't mind. There was some talk about, well, this is set in the Caribbean in a certain time, but that's kind of almost everything but the mermaid, really, that, that you know, but that kind of, um, um, I'm, I think that colorblind casting is fine, is good. And by the way, that has to go both ways. You have to be, you couldn't really have a white Othello because, because his race is evoked. But 
you do, you can't, if you're into colorblind casting, then you have to be very careful when you start talking about cultural appropriation, I think, and people aren't careful enough. Um, but colorblind casting only works if there is an absence of kind of racial, racialized conversation. You can't do To Kill a Mockingbird and have Atticus Finch be black. It don't make no sense. Um, and, um, uh, or, or Tom Robinson be white. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of um, uh, because their race is central to, um, uh, to the role. So the Little Mer I didn't have a problem with The Little Mermaid. Um, I didn't have much of a problem with the characterizations around the island that she watches up on for the simple reason that while it is pretty clearly the Caribbean, it's not named, whereas with Bridgerton, it's Britain in 18 whatever. It's, it's a place and a time. You can look and you can see what happened there. Now, be aware, these are not the things that keep me up at night mostly. <laughs> but um, uh, I thought it was, a, was, this was one of those things I thought it was interesting. I thought it was an interesting, I watched it all. It was in lockdown too, so like, you know, I ran out of Netflix during lockdown. But I watched it all and I was thinking, what is wrong with this? There's something wrong with this. It's bugging me. And, and then I worked it out, what was bugging me. And, and then I thought I would share it. <laughs> and that is, in a way, has been my job for 26 years. Right? What's going on here? Um, maybe, I'll sh maybe I'll share my thoughts about that. But, it, you know, it wasn't... It's, um, I, I put it in because I enjoyed writing it and because you want some currants in a cake, right? And to, to have non-stop analysis of race and class and so on, this was um, something a bit lighter. And I, I don't always get the opportunity to write things that are lighter. I was hoping you'd put in something saying, wait a minute, this isn't the crown. <laughs> Uh, we have a microphone, and so we're going to go ahead and uh, have that roving. So if you wouldn't mind, please, putting up... Okay, uh, Suki's got his hand up, and we have uh, one here in the purple, one in front uh, over there. So we've got uh, uh, three questions right away. And let's go ahead and get started with that. Let's see how far that we can get. Yes, yeah, I, I, I didn't care for Hamilton being hip-hop. I'm, I'm more of a goth and a mod, so uh, that would have been better. That was wonderful, Gary. Just two points. Um, one on either side of the pond. I think you made a comment around Brexit that um, you don't have to be racist to vote Brexit, but mm. everyone who's racist voted Brexit. I think you, you made that comment. Just any observations about um, the diaspora and the context of Brexit. And then just a, 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 something I was thinking about yesterday, um, that Obama was an inevitable at some point, maybe 15 years earlier than anyone expected. But Trump was only inevitable because of Obama, mm -hmm. and it changed the dynamics. There was always going to be a kickback, because I don't think Trump was inevitable, but I thought Obama was, and I just wondered if you've got any reflections on that. Um, so I've, I, don't think I've, I don't think I have ever said that. I know that some people have said um, precisely that formulation or a version of that formulation, which is not everybody... Not everybody who voted Brexit was racist, but all the racists voted for Brexit. Um, uh, I mean, my, my feeling about Brexit is actually complicated. Not what to do about it, I voted Remain. I didn't find that a very difficult choice. I don't love the European Union, but I felt like, well, you can't opt out of neoliberal globalization, so I'd rather be in one with social democratic protections. But I did find it intriguing the way that it was framed as though working class people didn't understand their own interests and that um, th these were turkeys voting for Christmas and they voted against their own interests. 
because lots of liberals, including lots of Guardian readers, vote against their interests every time they go and they vote Labour, who should put up their taxes. Um, because they have interests that are not only material interests. And I think it's patronising to suggest working class people wouldn't have other interests. Um, I, you know, I could argue with them until I'm blue in the teeth about why I thought it was a bad idea, but this sense that they were just kind of stupid and they didn't know what they were doing, uh, I thought was wrong. But I also feel that like a major part of what got Britain into that, has got Britain into that situation, relies on two things. The first is empire, and that inability to metabolize our decline as a country. I think it was a D Danish foreign minister who said, in Europe there are countries that are small and there are countries that have not yet realized they are small. Like, guess which one we are. Um, and the other was, and we're seeing it again now, a refusal of our political culture to deal with immigration. So right now we've got, send them to Rwanda, and then we've got the opposition saying that is inefficient and will cost too much, and we have a cheaper way of dealing with this problem. Nobody in the, in the dominant culture is saying that is wrong, it's obscene, it's illegal, and... Um, and that it demeans us as a country. We are better than that. Nobody's saying that. And this has been going on for quite a long time, where the Tories play the race card from the bottom of the deck, and then Labour either shut up about it or try and meet and match them. Well, with Brexit, all of those, I'm mixing my metaphors here, all of those debts came due. It was like, look, it's too late to have a conversation about immigration now. You've avoided it. You, you know, you put out bloody cups and, you know, you had your little bulldog and you found ra a range of ways of avoiding this conversation and blurring some really important moral lines. And now you have people voting around immigration, voting for this thing, and suddenly you're weekend break in Tuscany don't look so good. And this issue, which you thought was only going to affect people that you were never going to know, is now going to affect you. So I think that kind of, you know, and I think that it could have been different. With Obama, I th you know, with both Obama and Trump, I think both of them were possible in a way. If, if we look at, um, it, it stands to reason that the first black president would not be African-American. Kenyan-American, mixed race, all of that, black, but not the descendant of slaves. That the door that was open was a side door, not the main door. So it doesn't resolve the kind of historical, you know, trauma uh, uh, that they have. But then Trump, in a range of ways, was a more brazen, more disgraceful version of what was happening already. That in a range of ways, his, all the stuff that he got away with, it's not that different from Bush getting away with like dodging the draft. That all of the stuff about voter suppression, that was kind of taking place before that the kind of, the precursor, the, the, the sign of Trump was in Sarah Palin and how she energized the base. And so there was a kind of, there was a logic to him as the, dem, as the demographic challenges became more and more severe. They said, let's do away with the dog whistle. Let's just have a wolf whistle and see who comes. He was a roll of the dice. And, you know, and they came up snake eyes. They came up. Uh, and he was, in that sense, uh, he did benefit from an incredibly, I think, um, uh, accomplished and qualified but politically weak candidate in Hillary Clinton. Why don't we take both of these questions together, just for the time? Well, you know, when Trump said, uh, I can go out on... Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and no one's going to care. 
That's because Bush went out and killed millions <laughs> yeah. and wasn't prosecuted for a war crime. So, yeah. I mean, his Fifth Avenue was in Baghdad and mm. in Kabul. So, all right. Yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, Gary, thanks for your references to the uh, disasters of Tory Britain since 2019. Um, I was really interested to, to listen to and watch your interview with Jeremy Corbyn on Double Down News uh, quite recently. Mm. And I suppose, in essence, I'm putting you on the spot. You're a reporter anyway. And, I'm not. I'm well, I know you were. I know you, but you're yeah. an academic now, so even more so. Um, do you think if the election result had been different in 2019, that Corbyn would have made a transformative prime minister? Okay. And why don't we take the question ahead of you, and then we can just have Gary answer both of us. Um, yeah, sure. Um, you obviously, you've lived in America, uh, you talk, and you're American, and, and you're talking about America, and we often seem to talk about America and the UK like they're similar. But what's fascinating for me, in, in America, it was really clear that Obama had to be a Democrat and Trump had to be a Republican. But as you've alluded to, in the UK, you know, we've, we've, had, we've had a South Asian prime minister, two South, South Asian um, home secretaries, a, a black chancellor, three women prime ministers, only one prime minister who didn't go to Oxford, and they're all Tories. Um, and if you look at the... You know, the Labour Party, they are white middle-class men who went to, to Oxford. So it's like, I don't really understand what's going on here, you know, in terms of the left and race, you know. I can help you with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I, I actually spend quite a lot of time in my writing talking about how Britain and America are very, very different in a range of ways. Um, and how race is experienced very differently in a range of ways. But here are some things to bear in mind when we come to uh, race and representation. And if we start with that point about Obama not being African-American, right? So his ethnicity matters. He has a story. He can say, my father, when he made the speech at the Democratic Convention in 2004, which is what really propelled him, he said, my father came to America, a magical place. His dad came in 1959. Black people couldn't vote. But it probably was magical if you came from Kenya they can vote either because the Brits ran Kenya. So like it was, you know, he could say that. It was a legitimate thing for him to say. It's not an unreasonable thing for him to say. But none of that rhetoric was open to an African-American who would have to appeal through the kind of, you know, the racial trauma of the country, which leaves a lot of white people feeling, oh, you know, that's a downer. So, um, so is, this, is this this that he mad? Now shift over to Britain. Rather than thinking of them as Asian, let's think of their ethnicity. They are actually African Asians. They are from, uh, their parents are from Uganda, Tanzania, um, uh, Mauritius, Kenya. So they are part of a caste of people who lived above the Af African people in those countries, who had a terrible time and were kicked out with, you know, uh, uh, poor independence leadership, I think, but who were kicked out, came to Britain with some capital, um, not like Bangladeshis or Pakistanis, for example. So this term Asian that we use, and we all do it because it makes sense in certain moments, in this particular moment, it actually helps to say, well, actually, what are we talking about? Similarly, if we talk about the uh, people who were blank, I remember Stuart Hall saying, like, it was only in Britain that I, I realized I was West Indian. I thought I was Jamaican, you know. And if you've ever seen, you know, a group of Caribbeans get into it, Jamaicans, Barbadians, Trinidadians, they're not the same people at all. And, um, uh, but they come here and they are. And so, and then everybody comes here and we become black. But actually, then it, is, it would be more accurate to say that they are West African. So, no, there's nobody there from Somalia. There's nobody there, you know, or, or East Africa or Southern Africa. The, none of them are Caribbeans. They are, uh, their, their histories are in Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Places with significantly large uh, bourgeoisies and middle classes, once again, who come with capital. Um, and so James Cleverly is slightly different. His mum is a his mum was a midwife. His dad was a chartered surveyor. But even he went to private school. So then we can understand it kind of as a class issue, which has an ethnic component. 
you wouldn't want to be too reductive about this. It's not like everybody who came from, you know, who was of Indian, uh, African background thinks the same way, or all the people from West Africa think the same way. But it would also be a mistake, I think, to think, well, that's just a coincidence that they're all from these places and they all have these backgrounds, which includes usually private school in Britain or elsewhere. The other thing I think is important to understand is that when right-wing people rise, they, are, they rise as individuals, right? They, they're very keen to make it clear, like, nobody else is coming with me, don't worry. Sajid Javid said, if my dad came now, he wouldn't be let in, and that's fine by me. Right? So, um, so they don't, they rise as individuals. And it's quite easy to take on an individual, but when people rise on the left, they usually rise as tribunes of their race. They rise, they are more likely to rise collectively through unions, through social movements, and through other things. And so they come with more demands. They come with the demands of, Bernie Grant rises into the Labour Party with the demands of the working class in Tottenham, which are left demands. So, uh, and for all of the differences and the ways in which the Labour Party has been better in terms of representation, which it has, not in terms of people getting to the top, but if you look at the number of MPs and so on, the Labour Party is also really racist and complies with, you know, it was, you know, head of the colonies and all that kind of stuff. And so there's, there is an issue with race in the Labour Party as well. It's not the same issues with the Tory party. But I think if you put those two things together, I think it is clearer how we got into this, into this situation. With Corbyn, um, if he had won in 2019, would, would he have been... You know, first of all, I don't want to be a dick here, but like, we don't know, do we? We don't know, it's the truth of it. But my guess is that um, it would have been really hard just to see him rise to the, to the head of the Labour Party and to see how the infrastructure in that party, the um, institutions in that party, worked against him, how the parliamentary leadership in that party worked against him, and the fact that he rose without a movement. They were kind of trying to build a movement after he rose. So there was kind of, there wasn't the backing outside of the party. Uh, lots of people liked him, I know that, but lots of people individually, but you need a movement, you need when all these powerful people go into a room, they have to feel that more scared of the people outside of the room than the people inside of the room, and there wasn't that. That kind of, um, were he to have won, then those things would have been even more true, because it wouldn't have just been the Labour Party, it would have been the British state, and they would have done everything to undermine him. And can you imagine that Corbyn wins, and then... Um, COVID comes and Corbyn says, okay, everybody's got to stay at home. See? I knew it. Communism, we're going to be just like North Korea. Can you, can you see how different that would have been? I often think of the, um, the assault on the Capitol and how much legitimacy that would have had if Bernie Sanders had won. That people would have been saying, well, you know, on the one hand, you have this socialist, who knows what's going to happen to our rights. On the other hand, you have this right-wing people who aren't doing it the right way, but maybe they've got a point. That kind of, um, so I think it would have been, I think it, it would have been hard, but you know, um, creating a more equal and just society is hard. Uh, uh, and so we, we have to, you know, so we have to work harder. Tragically, we're out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking Gary Young, not only for his talk today, but for his contributions to helping us understand the world better.